Two, check, test, 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 test. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready? Yes, amen. Good. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that uh, taking tithes and offerings can become like, yeah, we did this every week, and it kind of loses its uh, uh -huh. significance? Yeah. Yeah. The ordinary? Well, this is not ordinary. That's right. That's right. That's this good. is not ordinary. That's right. That's right. That's good. Second Corinthians 9, 10, and 11 says, God is the giver of the seed. He gives us the bread that we may eat. And it says that he multiplies what he gives. It has to be that way. It has to be. Did you know In Genesis 8, 22, and I think this is really fascinating, that this scripture appears this early in the book of Genesis. Right. Okay. But have you ever known a time on earth when it wasn't a hot or cold, or winter or summer, or light or darkness? Has there ever been a time that you think of when that has not been true? It's true. In Genesis 8, 22, it says, that so long as the earth remains, there shall be seed, time, and harvest, heat and cold, winter and summer, daylight and darkness, and these things will never cease. Never cease. Which means they are perpetual. That's right. That's right. We are perpetual. And God is in partnership with us because he gives us the seed he That's gives right. us food to eat That's that right. we may be sustained that we may partner with him be the stewards of the crops so this morning everybody who gives something understand that God has put it in your hand yep. you're giving what you have received not only that, as we plant, then God will bless it because we are in partnership with it and it will be multiplied. It has to be multiplied back to us. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. That's right. It has to be. So, when you give, have this expectation that this is what God has given me as seed and I am planting it with intentionality of being blessed and it being multiplied for our mutual benefit. Yes. Yep. Good. That's right. That's really right? good. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Good word. Praise the Lord. Good teaching. Good stuff. Good stuff. Absolutely. Good stuff. God is always true. That's right. You ever found anything in the Bible that God doesn't believe? <laughs> I believe the whole thing. I'm right there with you. I believe everything he says. And he says this is good stuff. Now, we are about to emerge in a time in world history that's never, ever occurred before in terms of incredible blessings. But in Deuteronomy, it tells us that if we are in debt, we are in violation of kingdom law. And if we are in violation of kingdom law, anything, then we're in violation of all kingdom law. Hmm. 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 And it says we should not be debtors, but we should be lenders. loaning lenders to the nations. Yeah. That has to be brought into a balance because 
you can't be in violation and at the same time be a lender. We have homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, Lord, we come before you with these Hallelujah. thoughts in mind Thank you, Jesus. that we are partnership with you. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Partners. Amen. Partners. You give us life. Amen. You give us the seed. You give us the bread. You give us the water. You give us the sun. You give us the energy and the wherewithal to do these things that are consistent with the word that you have written and uttered. Yes. And Lord, we just put great blessing upon that. And we pray, Lord, that this morning, as we leave here, we be reminded of the fact that we are every day recipients of things that God has given to us, even though these might seem to be common. But let us not forget where it comes from, because we are blessed by the Lord and his great power, his great being. Any idea how much gold Solomon imported him to through to Zongaber when he was building the temple? 33 tons. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, you guys take the offering while they're doing that. A couple of quick announcements. Betty, would you come and talk about our upcoming lunch that we're going to be having next weekend? And so we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page, planning to be here. Great opportunity to bring a friend. How many of you know people always show up for food? Yeah. Right? They always show up for food. They might not show up for anything else. But we'll take them any way we can get them and then let the Holy Spirit get them. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. <coughs> we're a family. Amen. Amen. We're a family, and it's nice once in a while to sit around the table. That's right. Good work. How many of you know that? Yeah. How many of you know that in today's world, we're running all the time, we're eating with, um, on TV trays or in our easy chair, but it's nice to be able to come as a family to the table. And so if you've signed up for dinner next Sunday, we want you to remember, bring your potluck. And uh, check your name back on the back so we'll know how many seats to set up at the table. And we're going to have tables, Joshua. and we want you to come and join us. Joshua. I believe it's going to be a sweet, sweet time. Amen. You Amen. know that we haven't had a potluck since George and I was married? That was a year ago. <laughs> it's time for dinner, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, right. Amen. God bless you as you come and join us. Amen. Thank you, Betty. Appreciate that. One more announcement. Uh, well, I shouldn't say one more, a couple of more. How's that one? Remind you of tomorrow night, 6.30 p.m. right here, Men's Bible Study. They meet right back in the fellowship hall. So you're welcome to come, be a part of that. Amen. And then also our Wednesday. Is this Wednesday prayer or was that last Wednesday? This Wednesday is the coming prayer at 5.45. You can come and intercede if you're into intercession. We'd love to have you come be a part of that. And then, of course, hitting rooms on Thursday. That's from 11 to 1 o'clock. And then we're back here again next Sunday. Uh, don't forget also, I'm online Wednesday night, 7 o'clock to 7.30. We need to somehow get on the uh, overhead, our YouTube channel, and also our website. So making sure that you guys are going on to all the social media that we have. Because we want to make sure that we're getting the good news out there, not the fake news. Okay, so we have our, uh, our Word and Spirit Facebook page, also our YouTube page, so that you can catch everything that we're doing. And uh, I also have one more announcement. Beth handed me a, a little uh, tablet, and she's requesting names, uh, addresses, uh, phone numbers. She'd like to, on behalf of the church, send cards to you for anniversaries, birthdays, things of that nature. Isn't that nice? Amen. Because I don't have the time to do that. And not only do I not have the time, but I don't have the uh, skills in terms of you being able to read my writing. <laughs> so you don't want me sending you a note. It's like chicken scroll. But she is willing to do that. And so it'll be in the back area where the sign-up sheets are at. When you're back there getting ready to sign up for the luncheon that will happen next week and all the stuff you're going to good stuff you'll bring that's excellent be sure to sign up for this joseph you'd take that back there for me that would be wonderful thank you so very much all right i think we got all the stuff given and i'm using this wired mic because the handheld decided it needed to be paired and i don't have time to pair it right now so we're going to do that when you're not here is that all right all right so i'm going to switch over now and put this in here 
And I'm pretty loud, so you'll be able to hear me anyway, but uh, let's do that. You're rolling, Jeff? All right. Good morning, everybody that are tuning in right now to our Word and Spirit Facebook page. We're going to try to keep you online today, make sure that it doesn't drop out. We've just got through worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord, uh, having announcements, and then also uh, we've taken our morning tithes and offerings. And if you're at home and you'd like to give into this ministry, you can do it. We had a great challenge by Harvey Birdseye regarding seed time and harvest and both out of 2 Corinthians 9 and also out of Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. You can read those for yourself, but God desires to legitimately bless you as you respond to his biblical plan Amen. of blessing. So we just encourage you to do that. And then uh, one of the ways that you can give is by going online to wordspiritich.com. Go to our donate page. Hit campaign gives you a number of ways that you can give. Put in your personal information, credit card information, and in actuality. Hit send. It will come to us. Also, thank you so much for those that give via U.S. mail. You can postmark it, W-S-I-C. Make, it, make that uh, out to 1540. Not make it out to, but send it to 1540. You'll make it out to W-S-I-C, but you'll send it to 1540 Erie Lane, E-Y-R-I-E Lane, Eugene, Oregon, 97. 402. Again, that's 1540 Erie Lane, E-Y-R-I-E 97402, Eugene, Oregon. And thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. We pray God's abundant blessing on you as you give. Let's grab our Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of John chapter 14. I'm beginning a new series that will be at least uh, four teachings long. I don't know if you know it or not, but next week is Pentecost Sunday. Did you know that? Mm. One person went, hmm. <clears throat> the rest of you hopefully will catch up by then. But next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. It's, it's 50 days. The word Pentecost means 50th, and it's 50 days after Passover. Okay, And it's when really the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. Most theologians believe it's the day that the church was actually legally born, if you will, was on Pentecost Sunday. So you don't want to miss that, but I'm doing a precursor, and I'll be doing a series on the Holy Spirit as we lead up to that. My message, or the series title, is The Promised Holy Spirit. That is the, the message uh, theme or my series title. The message today, however, is entitled The Holy Spirit, Our Helper. How many of you know we all need helpers? Yes. Yes. I don't care who you are. At some point in time, you're going to need some help. As much as you want to be independent, do it on your own or whatever, you're going to need some help. My little grandkids, they become, they get to that independent stage and they'll say this. They'll say, Papa, I do it. Mindy says it right now. She says, Papa, I do it. I do it, Papa. And there's, I'm going to do it myself. I don't need your help. You're getting in the way. Let me do it. Well, there's a part of that that lets them grow and learn how to do things and excel, and that's fine. But the bottom line is at some point in time, we're all going to need to have to have help, Okay. We're going to be at John 14, verses 15 through 31 is our text today. John 14, 15 through 31. While you're turning there, let me tell you a story. So this past Wednesday, and then go back another week before that on a Wednesday, we were in, we were in Florida. Sunny Florida, 95 degrees, hot, beautiful day. We started off by going to Melbourne, Florida. We went there with uh, some friends of ours that actually had invited us. They had a timeshare to come spend with them for a week. And so it was with uh, Shuresh, not Shuresh, yeah, it was Shuresh and Brandy Thomas that we were there together and had a great time. Went out and saw the dolphins swimming around. Then we went to a place called the Florida Wildlife Park. We got to see alligators. I got to feed alligators. I got to fish for alligators. You know what fishing for alligators is? is Jake putting a chunk of hot dog on the end of a steel rod and dangling it in front of him. And man, they go snap, 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 snap. And I had a blast doing that. Well, on our way out, this is now in the afternoon, we were leaving the park, blitzing hot. As we're going out, my wife starts going, ah, 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 John, something's biting me. And she reaches up. And I look, and she had been bitten right here in her arm. It's turning red, and I'm looking around, and I notice there's a little stinger hanging out. You ever been bit by a wasp or a, a bee, and you have a stinger hanging out in you? Well, I reached up, and I helped her. Everybody said, I helped her. I, helped her. I grabbed the stinger, and I pulled it out. I put it on my finger so everybody could examine it and look at it. Yep, that's a stinger. Yep, that's a stinger. But it didn't prevent her arm to begin to swell and redness and all of that. 
So we went on and it hurt and then all of a sudden it began to be red, go this way. You know, there's a little measure of poison or whatever in that and it began to grow and expand or whatever, got home and put whatever medication on it she had, something simple, was not nothing, any big deal. I says, what, you want me to put my lips on it and suck the poison out with my lips? She goes, no, don't do that. But the day progressed. <laughs> you know, that's what I used to tell you in the old Wild West days about a rattlesnake bite, right? Rattlesnake, you, you cut it, you got to cut it with you know, X on it, then you put your lips on it and suck it out. Well, that's a wife's tale. You don't do that. <laughs> you probably kill you if you have a cavity or something like that. Get in your bloodstream. So, no, I was just kidding when I said that to her. But anyway, progressed. And so she, she had this all swollen up thing, and we got home. And I can't remember if I got you some kind of medication or whatever. Holly, Holly had medication. Yeah, she gave you the deduction on what to do with it of smashing up an aspirin and mixing it with a little water and putting it on there, and it helped it go down. But by the time we got home, it was still all kind of infected. And so she went to the Internet and looked it up. I mean, you can Google almost anything. <laughs> and so she Googled it, the top most whatever bugs in Florida. And number one is the bug that she believes got her. It was a noceum bug. It's called a noceum bug. They have little stingers and there's a picture that they blow it up because it's minuscule in size and whatever. But it looked just like the stinger that I pulled out of her. So that's what we're going with, whether it's it or not. That's what we believe it is. And we're, that's our story we're sticking to it. A noceum <laughs> bug, all right. So we got it out and now she's free from that and she's all healed up. But I helped her, Holly helped her. She had help from other people. We all need help in life. And Jesus spent three and a half years with his disciples. As he's getting ready to depart from them, he says, listen, guys, I'm going to go away. I'm going to go prepare a place for you that where I am, you can come and be with me also. It's called heaven. It's called a mansion. How have you read that earlier in John 14, 1? That's the setting of the writing that we're talking about here. It's the Last Supper. As we get to the conclusion of this, now we take a look at chapter 14, beginning at 15. Let's read down through verse 21, and let's see what's taking place. Verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands, or commandments, if you have a King James Version. You say, well, what are those commands? And literally, it's really, if you love me, keep my commands. Uh, first of all, if you look at uh, John 13, 14, and 15, it says, You'll wash one another's feet. Does that mean literally we're going to wash one another's feet? Maybe once in a while. But it's really inference of serving one another. Yeah. Right. That we serve one another. One of the commands that we have is to serve each other as That's Jesus right. served his, his, uh, his brothers in the faith. We get to serve one another. If you also look in John uh, 13, verses 14 and 15, it says to love one another. How many know love is not an option? i got to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, when you have your family, you, you, you're stuck with them. How many of you know that? There are times you don't feel like you like them very much, but you're still stuck with them. There have been times my wife has said to me, Honey, I love you, but I don't like you very much right now. Maybe you've had those same feelings, but you still love somebody. Okay? We also see that one of the commands is that we put our faith in the Father and the Son, according to John 14, verse 1. That we are loving the Father, we're loving the Son, but we're putting our faith in them. Put your trust in God. I've, you know, I've got to put my trust in God. It's a command. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God, but he's a rewarder of those that do what? Diligently, diligently seek, seek him. Seek. Do you diligently seek the Lord? It's a prerequisite. It's part of our passion. It's part of our heart to seek the Lord. We were talking about, Harvey was talking about an offering. Sometimes we come to church and things become profundry. They, just, they are just re, re, rote and routine. We just do those. It's part of tradition, if you will. Well, this is not part of tradition. We need to truly love one another just like we need to give as unto the Lord. And we need Amen. to be stimulated afresh in our giving. In fact, sometimes our relationship with God grows cold. That fire needs to be stoked. That fire needs to be stimulated once again that we stay actively hot and passionate for the things of God. The reason that there are times that revival needs to happen in the church is because the love of the church has grown cold. That's right. People become indifferent to God. People become indifferent to the things of God. Oh, God forbid that any of us would become indifferent Amen. and not seek Him, hunger and long for His presence and His power in our lives. Yes. That's right. Let's stoke those fires. Let me encourage you today. Let's don't be lukewarm. 
Jesus said, everybody say Jesus said. Jesus now John didn't say this, Jesus said it. If you're lukewarm, I will do what? Spew you out of my mouth. See, now you know that passage. I don't want to be spewed out of the mouth. I want to be hot, passionate, red hot for the things of God. All right, so going on in the text. Going on, it says this, and, if, and I will ask the Father, if you keep my commands, it's causatic, if you'll do this, I'll do this, what will that be? I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate, counselor, King James says, to help you, or comforter, the King James says, and he will give you another advocate, counselor, comforter, to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Because at that time, at that point in time, he had not yet been indwelling in the believers. It was after the resurrection of Christ. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Why? Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them. And note this, show my self to them. Yeah, everybody say, uh, everybody say relationship. relationship. I don't know about you, but I want a relationship. <laughs> He's going to reveal himself to us. It's an unveiling. We want that relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the major things, he says, I will ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate to help you. He's called the spirit of what everybody, truth. Everybody say spirit of truth. Yeah. So what happens is, is that this Holy Spirit is a helper with truth. He brings the truth. He makes it real. He makes it alive. You see, the truth is this. Jesus was and will be with them and us now. He says, I'll be with you. Not only says that, but I'm going to be in you. That's the promise. Not only is he going to be with you, but I'm going to come upon you. Acts 1.8. So we see that in, in John 20, 22, it says that when Jesus with his disciples after his resurrection, it says that he breathed on them and said, do what? Receive the Holy Spirit. That's where I believe they were indwelt by the Spirit. How many of you know there's an indwelling and there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit? Next week we'll talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Today we're really dealing with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The moment you're born again, you get the Holy Spirit. He comes and takes up residence on the inside of you. So he is the helper with truth so that we know who Jesus is. We know who the Father is. Now in the Old Testament, everybody say the Old Testament. The, Old Testament. the Holy Spirit came upon people. Okay, he came upon them. In fact, if you remember in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, it says the Holy Spirit brooded over the face of the deep. Face of the deep. Yep. Uh, yep. He brooded over. He was there in the very beginning in creation. The Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all of them had their different responsibilities in creation, in the creative act. And then we go on later on, and we see that the Holy Spirit came upon. You remember these two guys, Bezalel and Ahila? They were helpers in building the temple. The Lord came on them and anointed them with the task and the ability to be excellent craftsmen. To do what they did is unto the Lord. He came upon them for that. How about Moses and the elders in Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. When Moses took of the spirit that was upon him, laid his hands upon the 70 elders, and it anointed them, and it came upon them. Why? To have wisdom to lead the people of Israel, to discern hard cases, to give wise counsel. It came upon them, but it didn't remain with them. It came upon them for a certain season. And then we also see that it came upon the judges. Remember Samson. Remember Gideon. That came upon them to do what they did in their military responsibilities. The judges. How about Deborah? Last week I talked about her when Deborah led the nation of Israel. But it also came upon the prophets. Remember Elijah, Elisha, the prophets of God who spoke the counsel and the wisdom of God. Spoke on behalf of God. Did exploits in God's name. That was coming upon. But now in this time, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm going to come and I'm going to dwell with you. You see, orphans have to fend for themselves. They have to support themselves and they have to do all those things that are looking to pro protect themselves and provide for themselves. How many of you know the Lord says, I'm not leaving you as an orphan. Amen. He says, I'm coming to dwell with you. I like that fact. Amen. I'm coming to, to help you. My wife likes Andy Griffith, and so do I. Anybody ever seen the Andy Griffith show? Yeah. I think I've got many of those stories memorized. I've seen many of them many, many times, and probably you do too. But I came home the other day, and Helen had on Andy Griffith. And it was one of the stories where Opie goes out and shoots the mother bird that has little birds in the nest. 
Remember this story? Yeah. The poor little birds are out there chirping, and Dad comes home, and he just he just starts getting on Opie, rightfully so, because Opie shot the mom. Now what is the orphans going to do? How are they going to survive? What's going to take place? Well, Opie was all convicted and hurt, and so the next thing you know, he goes and he gathers worms and insects and everything else, and his dad says, what are those for? He says, i got to feed the birds now. I killed their mom. i got to take care of them. So he has a sense of responsibility. Well, I've got to tell you, our Heavenly Father, and then there's Jesus, Jesus Christ, our elder brother, he says, I'm going to leave to go back to where I came from, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He says, I'm with you here. Now you're walking with me, but you're going to have the Holy Spirit 24 seven morning, noon and night. You see, if Jesus was still here on this earth, he could only be with one of us at a time. In other words, he couldn't be in all parts of the earth, but the Holy Spirit is everywhere at once. This is everywhere at once at one time. He's with us in the here and now, and we can become dependent upon on him. We have this relationship with the Father through the Son because of the Holy Spirit. He's the broker in the relationship. He's the one that helps us relate to God. So the Holy Spirit is our helper. He helps us with the truth. Number two, he is, help, he is our helper with obedience. Look at verses 22 through 24. 22 through 24. Then Judas... Not Iscariot said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourselves to us and not to the world? The reason the writers write and put in the parentheses, not Iscariot, because it distinguishes there was another Judas in the 12. He actually was also known as Thaddeus. Okay, so there he had a double name, if you will. And then it says in verse 23, and Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. In other words, they'll, twel- they'll dwell, they'll tabernacle, they'll be in relationship. Then it says this, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who has sent me. So the way that we have the ability to walk in obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ is because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do it. We got help. He's the helper who helps us with obedience. In our human flesh, we're incapable, but we have something that enables us beyond our human flesh and our own inabilities to help us conquer and overcome temptations, trials, and tests that we walk in victory. Obey my teaching. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. He prompts, leads, guides, and directs. Go with me to the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Don't lose your place here. We'll come back here. But I want to have you now go to the book of Romans chapter 8 and listen to these words Romans 8 14 Paul writes to the church at Rome he says to them in verse 14 for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God look at your neighbor and say he's talking to you right now oh man one person said it look at somebody say he's talking about you right now okay there you go the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you no longer so that you live in fear again rather the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry abba father Amen. the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are god's children Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. What is he saying? The Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to overcome and to live through and to to overcome temptations, trials, and tests and live in victory. He also promises to do certain things. I was talking to Marilyn. Marilyn's daughter had a baby. It's her granddaughter, okay, in Jamaica. As Marilyn was telling me this story, what ended up happening is, is that she went to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, no, go home. Come back during the weekend. You have a couple of more days before you're going to deliver the baby. Marilyn was talking to her daughter, knowing that she had high blood pressure. She says, no, the hospital's 50 miles away. I think you really need to go to the doctor now, to the hospital now. She was prompted to tell her daughter to go. Now, the doctor said one thing, and I'm not against doctors, and I'm not against nurses, but they don't know everything. So what ends up happening is the daughter went. When she got there, she was dilated at a certain level, and that baby was coming, and that baby came way quicker than the doctor ever imagined, and she delivered it, and she was at the right place at the right time. Why? Because Mama, who is now Grandmama, heard the word of the Lord prompted by the Spirit, says, you need to do this. Amen. And it superseded what the doctor said. 
And so we need to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Why? He prompts us. It reminds me of mother's quote-unquote intuition. Sometimes mother's intuition for believers is just the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit that is giving direction on what to do and how to do it. That's point number two. The Holy Spirit helps with obedience. Number three, he is the helper with our teaching. In other words, he helps us with teaching. He will educate and help us understand the word of God. Take a look, if you would, please, back in the book of John, chapter 14. Pick it up at verse 23. Actually, verse uh, 25. Yeah, that's where I want to be at, verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, there's that word again, the advocate, which means comforter, helper. The Greek word is parakaleto. It literally means one called alongside to help. One called alongside to help. Or literally, one called along to one's aid. Okay, to called alongside to one's aid. Have you ever needed somebody when you're on the roadside and your car's broken down and you need help or you need assistance? They've come to your aid. Years ago when we were in college, Helen uh, took a bunch of young people, a bunch of people that went with her up to her hometown from uh, to Spokane, Washington. And uh, we went up there on a weekend. She worked at Mr. Steak in those days. And she had a 64 Buick, I think it was, Buick Skylark, two door, two bucket <laughs> seats in the front and a full bench seat in the back. So there was her and there was me. I was the driver. And then there were like three people in the back. I think it was, I think it was Quizzy, Julie, and one more person who I don't remember. Who, Oh, yeah, Derny Wood. That's right, Donald Wood. We called him Derny. And so we were going to go up there, and so we headed up to Spokane, Washington. I picked her up at 9 o'clock because that's where she worked at Mr. State, got off. I picked her up, and I drove, and I drove all the way from Eugene to almost Spokane, Washington, Joe. We get to, just before we get to Ritzville, what's the lake right there to the side of the road before you get to Ritzville? Sprague Lake, okay? So we're at Sprague Lake, and we run out of gas. This is during the gas shortage. Remember the gas shortage? Yeah. And I tell you what, if things don't change, we're going to be there again, saints. Made up. I'm telling you, yeah. It was an embargo. It was a gas war. And you could only get gas on certain days. Gas stations were only open at certain times. And so we ran out of gas coming down the hill. Sprague Lake's on the right. And so I'm the driver. I pull off. And I says, all right, I'll go get some gas. So I get out and I hitchhike and I go to the next town. What was the name of the town? Was that Sprague? Is that the name of the town? What is the name of that little town right there? I don't know. But anyway, I got there and I beat the gas stations open. They opened at 6 a.m. So I got there, had to wait, went into the gas station. And I says, listen, I ran out of gas. We got some people that's on the side of the road. We're about, I don't know, five miles down the road. And so I had to get a gas can from them, borrow a gas can from them. I had to get gas in the gas can, pay for that, then go back out on the freeway and, and hitchhike again to get back to where about across the freeway was at to get across the freeway and those, and it's still this way, the median's rather long. It's like about a quarter of a mile through to the freeway right there. And so this is in about early spring, well, late spring time. So we've been about May, something like that, a first part of this time right now. And so I remember I went back there and I hitched a ride and I got off too soon. I missed my point, my landing point. And I go, oh no, I need to hitch another ride. This is beginning to be an ordeal, man. <laughs> So I hitchhike another ride, and I get in this car. The first one was a group of family. It was a whole family. Who would pick up a guy with a gas can? Well, anyway, and times were different then. They picked me up, and I got the ride. And so I got another ride, and I found that I could see the car down there in the distance, and the grass was high. And before we got to that place, it says, Beware of rattlesnakes. <laughs> this, and it's still there to this day. If you travel in that area and you stop at the rest area right there by it, it says this sign, Be careful for rattlesnakes on the sidewalks. Watch for rattlesnakes on the side. Why do they like to get out there and send them? Says, I hate snakes and I really hate rattlesnakes. <laughs> and so I look around in God's man of faith and power. I grab my gas can and I just start running through that big old tall brush and I start hippity hopping like the cowardly lion, like he's running away from the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. And I'm just scooting across there till I get all the way to where they're at. <laughs> I get there all out of breath and I get there and I figure out now, how am I going to get 
this gas in the back of her gas can, I mean into her tank. And so I says, all right, there's a Pringles can somebody had. So we fashioned a makeshift funnel, put that in there, start pouring the gas in. I think I got a couple of gallons of gas, enough to get us going, get us started, and then on over where it was. How many of you know we needed help? There are times in life you need help. And the Holy Spirit, what His job is, is that He will lead us into all truth. Look at verse 25. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you some things, a few things, all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So all the teaching that Jesus had given to His disciples, He says He's going to take that, and He's going to remind you of that. And not only that, He's going to bring revelation to you, teaching you've not known, He's going to bring it to you as well, so that you'll know how to live successfully as a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. He will help us with teaching. There is no premium on ignorance. Are you hearing me? That's right. Ignorance means unlearn. There is in the U.S. government. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're stupid. Ignorance means you just didn't learn. Okay? So you're going to have to learn some things from the Word of God that are the commands of Jesus Christ that will enable you and I to be successful disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. He'll take all that Jesus taught. He'll make it known to them. Go to Ephesians, if you would, chapter 2. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2. Y'all still with me? Yeah. yeah. Good. Pick it up at verse 19. Verse 19 says this. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and all, also members of his household. Why? Because you came in the right way, the only way. Did you get that? Yeah, it's through, it's through Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way to become a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's through Jesus Christ. He says, these people then are members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him... The whole building, that's everybody here, everybody that's a believer, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. He dwells in it. Everybody say, He dwells in it. (laughs) In Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. How? By His Spirit. Large case, Holy Spirit. Amen. That we together are reminded of the teaching of the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. He brings that in remembrance to us. And as a result of that, then we live the way that we need to live, which is fulfilling His commands. Go back to the book of John, chapter 14, verse number 27 says, Peace I leave you with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus never troubled? No, he was troubled. Were the disciples ever troubled? Yes, he just saying, don't let your hearts be troubled in the midst of your trouble. John 16, 33, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation or you will have trouble. Are you still living in the world? Yes. You are, aren't you? And until Jesus comes or you go to be with him, you're going to have trouble. But he says, don't. Let the trouble get you down. He says, rejoice because I've overcome the world, its problems, its trials, its tests, everything it throws at you. I've overcome it because you're in me and the Holy Spirit's in you. You also are going to be able to overcome it. So no matter what happens, you hit a deer, you wreck your car. That's called life. You're going to overcome. It's not going to set you back. Okay. Remember when the 401ks, 401k, the stock market blew up and everything fell apart and many of you lost half of your 401k? It's not the end of the world. That's it may right. seem like That's it right. at the time, right. but it's not. There are all kinds of things that are happening. My point is this. In the midst of the uncertainty of life and the cosmos in which we live with the craziness that's going on throughout the world, I'm telling you that we are overcomers because of Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit that's going to lead us into all truth and cause us to walk in success. Hallelujah. And we'll be at peace. 
Isaiah 26, 3, Thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, for he careth for thee. If you're having troubles, put your mind on Jesus. Amen. He'll keep you in peace. He'll put you in peace. He'll bring to remembrance. I remember <clears throat> that we need to be reminded of God's truth. That's point number three. He will help us with the teaching that we've been taught and we receive. He says, I'll give you peace. That's shalom. The word shalom isn't just nothing missing, nothing broken, but it really means everything which makes for our highest good. Everything that makes for the highest good. That's what they would say, the Israeli, when they met. They would say, instead of how you doing, they would say shalom. When they left, they would say shalom. So it's peace when you met. It was peace when you left. It was a normal greeting. We were really meaningful, depth of, uh, of meaning in terms of that whole thing of peace. And the fact that nothing is missing, nothing is broken. However, it also means everything that makes for your highest good. That's what I'm wishing you when I say shalom, when I say Amen. peace. That's the kind of peace that Jesus says, I'm giving you. Complete. I'm leaving with you. It's a complete and total peace. Yep. Number four. The Holy Spirit will also help us with confidence. Number one, he's a helper with truth. Number two, he's a helper with, the, with our obedience. Number three, he's a helper with the teaching that we've received. And then finally, number four, he is a helper with confidence. How many of you know sometimes your confidence can be shaken? Well, we need to not let it be shaken. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Verse 28 says this. You've heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, You'd be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming, that's Satan. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. John 5, 19, Jesus says, I only do the works that I see the Father doing. That's Wouldn't it be right. good if we got good at that? Yes. Yeah. That I only do what I see the Father doing. What the Father's doing, that's what I'm doing. Yes. Okay. I'm not going the polar opposite direction, but where he's going, boom, that's where I'm going. I'm following his footsteps. When I was a little kid, I, I just, I love being around my dad. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a daddy's boy. I've been all my life. My dad's gone to be with Jesus this year at the first of the year. But when I was a kid growing up, I wanted to go everywhere my dad went. If he went hunting, I wanted to go hunting. If he went fishing, I wanted to go fishing. If he went to the boxing gym, I wanted to go to the boxing gym. If he's going to work, I wanted to go to work with him. My work ethic comes by dogging my dad's steps, being with him everywhere he went, watching what he did, how he interacted with people, all of those things. I watched that. I'm reminded of a time when it was in the winter time, brutal, you know, South Dakota winters. It gets cold. There's snow on the ground. And he says, well, let's go hunting. So we went out south of town and he took the 22 and we headed out there. And for those of you that don't know about rabbit hunting, specifically cottontail hunting, they like to be around old abandoned buildings because they burrow underneath them and it keeps them warm and they can be under there and they can hop out and find their food or whatever. It's amazing that I, I don't think I can even shoot a rabbit anymore. I'm too kind hearted. I can still <laughs> shoot deer and I can still shoot elk and bear that, but, but rabbits and birds and, and, uh, and uh, squirrels are kind of like, I can't, I can't bring myself to shoot them anymore. Uh, anyway, let's leave that alone. Let's move on here. But I remember, I, remember, uh, I remember going rabbit hunting with him. And we're out there and it's snowed and it's fresh snow. It's glistening and everything else. And it's deep. And as a little boy, believe it or not, my dad was only 5'3". So that means his stride wasn't very good, big. But when I was a kid, my stride wasn't very big either. So anyway, I remember going out there and he'd go walking along. And I remember just trying to get in his footsteps, following in his footsteps. So that I could just follow right where he was at because he'd break the track in the snow. And I wouldn't have to wade through it and wear myself out. If you've ever walked in snow any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. It'll wear you down because it's deep. So I'd walk along with him. And I would walk in his footsteps. It's the same way. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. And then he says, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I'm going to go, but he's going to be with you. And he's going to be with you 24-7. He will be with you always. Amen. He says, if I go away, I'm coming back to you. And how many of you know they saw him after the resurrection? 
He says, going on in the text in verse 30, I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. You see, he knew the enemy was going to have that one last encounter. You remember in Gethsemane, it says that he sweat as it were great drops of blood. It didn't say that he sweat drops of blood. It just says they were as if they were great drops of blood. Read the text and be accurate. Now, they may have been, I don't know. Some say the, the capillaries can burst and they could, they could bleed. That's very possible. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It sweat, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in anguish, in agony. Why? Because he's in the very throes of death. And the devil is tempting him to not go to the cross. When he knows that the will of God, I keep my Father's commands, as that the only mitigation, the only thing that will appease is his blood, his ransom for ours, Amen. his life for ours. It's the only thing that will suffice. And he's in the throes of it, and he's travailing. And not only that, but even his own disciples now, they're sleeping on the job. They're over here, and they're sleeping, and he's interceding. He's in the very throes of death. And man, they don't even care. It's almost as if. He says, could you not tarry one hour with me? Couldn't you guys hang with me? For one hour? Yes, Doesn't it make you embarrassed sometimes about our prayer life? It does. The carnality and the fleshiness of us. Amen. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Right. Man, we got to bolster the spirit man, the spirit woman. It's not a put down, but it's a reality. Right. I want to be like Rocky when it comes to spiritual matters. Man, I want to climb the stairs in Pennsylvania. I want to get up there and jump up and down because I'm victorious. I did, by the way. We were there one time with Helen and I and Matthew, and she was over at the Mint going into the coin thing. They came out and going through a tour of the Mint, the U.S. Mint, and I says, hey, get me going up these stairs. And I stood up there, and I held my hands in the air, and she took a picture of me. I was right where Rocky was when he made the movie. Why? Because I want to be victorious. I don't know about you, but I just believe that being victorious and being a conqueror is the normal Christian lifestyle. Amen. Now, I know it may not always seem like that, but that's what I'm contending for. I am believing Amen. for. I'm living that way. I'm declaring that. I'm speaking that. I believe it is the normal Christian life. No, I'm not saying you'll never have difficulties. No, I'm not saying you'll never have attacks because he had an attack. That's why he says the, the prince that's coming against me. I know he has one last thing after me. Remember Jesus said after his temptation, when he was in the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, came and the enemy tempted him. And it gets to the end of the three temptations. He's victorious with everyone because he what? Speaks the word. He says, it's written, it's written, it's written, it's written. Those that are watching by Facebook, those that are watching by YouTube, it's the same for you as it is for those here. It is written, it is written, it is written. How we come back at the enemy is we say it's written. But how do I know it's written? Because we obeyed the commands that Jesus spoke. We obeyed the commands of the Father. Why? Because he said to do it. And that we demonstrate our love for him because we are doing that. Not because we have to, because we want. To. Amen. It's a demonstration of our heart. Amen. I love my wife and I do things for her because I love her. We even had this discussion this morning. Because my way of love is different than her way of love. Her way of love and her love language is she wants to hear it. She wants to hear, honey, I love you. Helen, I love you. She wants me in the morning before I leave. What time is it? It's 5.30. It's 6.30. Whatever time it is, I say, honey, I love you. Whatever time I'm leaving in the morning, 5, 5.30, 6.30, I love you. She wants to hear it. She wants me to pat her on the head while I stroke her head like this. I kiss her on the forehead. I kiss her on the lips. She goes, oh, my breath is bad, but I love it anyway. She wants me to tell her that I love her. And I don't do it enough because it wasn't familiar with us growing up but she likes that you know what my way of showing love is making a hero sandwich like she's never had before knock her socks off <laughs> doing things for her that's my love language so lately i've been if it's usually I'll, I, i'm up first so i cut a banana and I'll leave a banana there for her before I leave. And she'll have half a banana. I'll have eaten the other banana. And now lately I bought a really nice bag of oranges there, just juicy as everything, you know. And I'll cut them up in fourths. And then I'll eat four and then I'll leave her four. And I buzz out. She goes, oh, honey, I just wanted you to know, I really appreciate you putting the oranges out here. I says, that's because I love you. I know, but I also want to hear it. She reminded me. <laughs> but it's true. The reason we do what we do is not because... We have to. It loses all its emphasis. It's because I want to. Amen. I want to. We were, we were worshiping the Lord today, both in 
worship practice and also as we were singing the song the one song that talks about that went right along with the message about not leaving us as orphans and then there's another passage that talks about the kingdom i love that uh, what a beautiful name it is there is no kingdom. There is no rival. Man, it tears me up on the inside because there's no rival that's greater than God Almighty, than our Lord Jesus Christ. I wish I could take this heart that I have for Christ and impart it to you and that you have the same passion that I have. That it's not fake. Yes, I love that, that you do. I'm glad to hear that. That it's not feigned, it's not fake, it's real, it's genuine. Man, my heart outweighs everything. And I love my wife like you can't believe. I'll do anything for her. I'll defend her. The other night she said, honey, it's like Friday night. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. And she wakes me up out of a totally sound sleep. She says, honey, wake up. I think somebody's at the front door. I think somebody's beating on the door. I go, oh boy. So I get up. I mean, out of a sound sleep. She goes, I don't know if I was dreaming or what it was. So I get up. I go get my nine millimeter SIG. I didn't jack a shell then, I just grab it, put my finger on it the right way. I know how to handle a weapon. Got it, it's got the sights on it so you can see in the night. I'm walking through my house, I go out and I look out the front door, I look through the window, make sure there's nobody there. Go to the back door, turn the light on, make sure, sure there's nobody there. I go to the side bed, bedroom window so I can get a look and see if anybody's out there. I go look around everywhere, nobody's there. Ah, I'm going back to bed, man, what's going on? <laughs> I put the weapon up and I go back to bed and I go to sleep, slept like a baby till I had to get up at, I don't know, whatever time it was, six in the morning. But I'm there to protect her. <laughs> It's natural. It's normal. When I'm going down the road and something steps out or a car doesn't do what it's supposed to and I step on the brakes, it's natural for me to reach over and put my hand over like that. Now, if I do that, how much more will the creator of the universe take care of his kids? That's how I can have confidence in Christ, his purpose for my life, his purpose for your life, and that it's in my turn, in my response back to him. He goes on to say, verse 30, I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. It means he has no hook in me. He has no place in my life. I wish I could say that. I wish you could say that. Amen. Ephesians 4.27 Give him no territory, no topos, no topography. Give the enemy no territory in your life, in your thought life, in your speech life, in your action life. Give him no place. The Lord's saying he has no grip in me. He says, I'm going to face him head on because he has no hold on me. Jesus sets the example of love in action. Know what he says. He goes on and says, but he comes so that the world may learn that I Love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Love is demonstrated in action. A couple of Wednesdays ago, I was sharing about David and Jonathan. And when Jonathan, his brother and brothers and his dad were all killed in Mount Gilboa, they hung their headless bodies at Bethshean on the walls that were there and there was only a handful that was left and so when David came into full power both kings over both Judah and Israel he says is there anyone from David's family I can show kindness to because of covenant relationship and somebody said well there's this son that David or that Jonathan had his name was Mephibosheth and when they were attacking and the Philistines killed them his nurse took him, and as he was leaving, she was escaping. He fell, and he became a cripple. Remember the story? Yeah. Yes. He's lived that way all of his life. He says, bring him to me. And so basically, what is he? Set him up for life. He says, listen, the lands that you have, Ziba, your dad's servant, is now going to take care of the lands. All the proceeds, you'll split. He'll get half. You'll get half. But you're going to eat at my table like one of my own family members. That's how I'm taking care of you. Amen. That's the level of response. That's love demonstrated in action. David to Jonathan and to his progeny, those that were part of his household. Why? Because he was in covenant relationship. Again, as I close, 
the statement here we see at the very end, verse 31b, I love the Father and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. It's love in action. We all need help. Nobody's exempt from it. We all need it. This past Tuesday, <clears throat> I was riding my new bike, my brand new bike. And I take Allie, our dog, for a ride pretty much every day that I can. If it's not blistering hot, I'll try to wait till the end of the day so it's not as hot or little pads on the pavement. But it's Tuesday, and I have this 29-inch bike. It's really made for people that are six feet tall. I'm not six feet tall, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Helen and I both got a carbon copy of our bikes. Our bikes are kind of worn out, so we bought the same ones. And she could almost be six foot. But anyway, needless to say, we're, I'm riding this bike. And I had pumped up the air because it felt like their tires were low. So I put the air in it, and I looked at the tires. It says 40 PSI, which is 40 pounds of, per square inch. So I filled it up to that amount. I have one of those tire pumps so I filled both the front and the back up I you know you can bike a lot easier when the tires are filled up rather than oh, when yeah. they're low so I'm buzzing out and I'm going on about a half a mile left of my ride and I'm going on a piece of sidewalk on barger and as I'm going on the sidewalk they have these little crests where the roots cause the sidewalk to, yeah. to buckle a little bit yeah. yep. and I hit that baby with that front tire and it blew up wow. yeah it blew up I mean I mean I was like a blood pop pop right there the whole front tire came off, the whole inner tube flew out, and then I went like this, right over the, right over the top. I landed, so I'm on the sidewalk, and then there's the you know city-owned property that they have there, and there's the road. Well, I landed in that five-foot stretch right there, boom. Head first, face first, whatever. I did a face plant, I didn't hit my face. I landed, caught myself on my arms, landed on my chest, I had a royal wipeout. And I just like, okay, everything okay, no broken bones, whatever. Allie, she's over here. She's going, what's going on, man? What's happening, Dad? What are we doing here? And I've had more than one wipeouts, by the way. Uh, anyway, so I wiped out big time, and I picked my bike up, and I looked at it. And, man, that tire was completely thrashed. My rim is all chattered. And I just go, oh, this isn't good. What am I going to do? I'm like a half a mile from the house. So I'm trying to think, what am I going to do? I have my phone with me. So I take the bike, I pick it up, and I throw it in the brush over here because I think I'll just walk home the rest of the way, and Ellie will get a walk out of it, and that'll be the end of it. And I had a long day at work. I was tired. And I says, "Now nah, I'm going to call Helen and have her get my pickup and come get me. See, that will see if she loves me or not, right? <laughs> I dialed the phone number. It rang. She picked up. She goes, what's going on? I go, well, I need you to get my pickup. I had a wipeout. She hates those words. <laughs> anyway, I had a wipeout. I need you to go get my spare keys, get my pickup, come get me. I'm over here on Barger and pick up my bike and get the dog so we can go home. And she goes, really? And I go, yeah. She didn't like driving my truck. She goes, okay, I'll do it. Fine. So she got in it and Anyway, I think you called me because you, what would, I can't remember what you said. I don't remember. When, oh, I know. She didn't know how to get the emergency brake off. That's what it was. So she got the emergency brake off. And, and uh, anyway, she came and got me. And I threw the bike in the back, threw the dog in the truck first so she'd stay out of the road. And then Helen got in the rig and I threw my bike in the back. And in fact, it's still in the back of my pickup because I got to take it back. It's not going to work for me. I got to get a different bike. <laughs> it's just not going to cut it. But the whole thing's all chattered up and messed up. But I needed help. We all need help. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He's the promised Holy Spirit that's come, is here, available to help us. How do you need help in your life right now? You need to go to him. Consult him. He's the comforter. He's the one called alongside to give you aid. Don't be too prideful to ask for his help. Because that's why he's there, 24-7, available to help you spirit, soul, mind, will, emotionally, physically, in every way. Father, I pray right now for everyone that's watching today, those that are here and gathered. I ask, Lord Jesus, that we would not be filled with pride, but we would be mindful of the Holy Spirit's desire and Jesus promised to send us another comforter that's to come alongside and to give us aid. And we reach out and receive that aid today in whatever capacity, whatever form that we need. And that, Lord, we would receive it. And we'll thank you for it and give you the praise. 
Bless those that are watching. Bless those that are here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hey, listen, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior,